let's we start with the demonstrations and for that we will have uh, some slides and after that we will we will organize groups this Okay, if you are ready, you can start. Thank you. All right, so this is going to be the hands-on part of the talk. I have some slides. I'm going to go through them quickly just so that everyone can have as much time as they want to look at the actual devices. Uh, but I want to explain just briefly what each of them uh, does. So <clears throat> the first device I have is a plasmonic reader. I could talk forever about this because it's my project. Um, and I have some slides coming up that have this in more detail. It reads plasmonic sensors, uh, localized surface plasmon resonance. This is something I think there's going to be uh, a lecture in a lab later this week about. Uh, it's a very exciting project. Uh, we have a normal transmission-based microscope. This one is the most fun to play with. I have a bunch of samples. People can try out different samples. It's a very simple design. I'll, I'll speak to the design in a second. The third device is a mobile phone-based ELISA reader. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects in the lab because ELISA is a test that's done all over the world. Um, it's very common in clinics and labs everywhere. And um, this is a device I think can really have a lot of impact. Um, so we'd love to talk with you about that, and I have some slides detailing this more. And then the fourth and fifth device are the Giardia analyzer and the DNA analyzer um, that I talked about in the presentation uh, before the break. So the first, I'd like to just briefly go over what the plasmonic reader is. So that's, that's this device uh, with the, the dome on top, and this reads plasmonic sensors. Plasmonic sensors um, are a emerging type of sensor for detecting and sensing protein concentrations. There's work recently that's been published that actually uh, can get a virus count in a given blood sample, an unprocessed blood sample. Um, so the way localized surface plasmon resonance works is it creates, on this sensor is a nanostructured grating. There's a nanohole array on this sensor. And these nanostructures support plasmon resonances, which are collective electron oscillations. When a molecule or something of some sort of substantial weight, uh, something larger than an ion, but something around the size of a protein molecule, kilodalton size, is adsorbed onto the surface, specifically through biochemistry, it can react with the near field of the sensor and change the location of the plasmon resonance. So where the, uh, spectrally, where the electron oscillation is occurring. So if you were to look at the transmission spectrum of a localized surface plasmon resonance sensor, it would look something like this in the bottom here, where the blue curve represents the transmission before, where the peak is the peak of the plasmon resonance. And after molecules are absorbed, that spectra will undergo a red shift by three or four or five nanometers. And you can read them out with a spectrometer, or in the case of this project, I've created a device that uses um, LEDs and an image sensor to read out uh, the plasmon resonance. Localized surface plasmon resonance sensors are also very cool because they're very cutting edge, but they're now becoming very cheap to produce. Using soft lithography techniques, which is basically a molding process with a UV glue or an optical glue, you can actually replicate nanostructures and then coat them with gold. Um, in an E-beam evaporator, which does need a clean room and an expensive piece of equipment, but it's an incredibly high throughput process, meaning that these sensors can be disposable. They can be flexible. They, the, the ones depicted in this image are, are printed on an overhead transparency. Um, so we're looking at a future where maybe plasmonic sensors are embedded in existing medical technology or are printed on your books or things like this, um, things of diagnostic value, or maybe even wearable sensors. 
So this, this device uses four LEDs in a light cone, um, which guides, guides the light down to a single aperture, such that these LEDs can turn on one at a time and illuminate the sample at normal instance, which is very important for reading uh, localized surface plasma on resonance. Um, all of this is 3D printed like the other materials um, uh, I've presented so far. And I, I can talk to you more about this. Um, this design is not necessarily novel, but the framework behind how it was designed is very novel. I won't go into all the details, but basically we used machine learning techniques, as I've discussed before, to select the optimal LEDs with which to use in this design from a larger library online. So there are thousands and thousands of LEDs online that you can order. And it's hard when you're engineering a system like this to know exactly which LEDs would be the most optimal, given a specific plasmonic sensor design and an inherent fabrication variability. So this framework takes into account the fabrication variability and the specific plasmon resonance to actually select the optimal LEDs that can be embedded in a modular way into the sensor. The second device I have is a transmission microscope. Um, it's very simple. This is the one we take to elementary schools and middle schools. Um, it has two white LEDs and a diffuser and then a simple sample tray and only a Z directional stage. You can, you can manually move the sample on the XY by pushing or pulling and you can focus by adjusting the, um, the Z stage with the focusing knob. Um, I have a bunch of samples here you can try out in the microscope and take a look at. I have blood smears and different animal uh, samples that are on uh, a glass slide. Uh, so this is a really uh, fun device that's actually currently being used for uh, sickle cell imaging uh, at UCLA. It has a resolution of 0.87 microns tested with the Air Force target as we discussed earlier. This is an example of blood cells. We also took this device um, uh, in collaboration with a group from Ghana uh, several years ago to actually look at cystomyosis, um, which is a parasitic worm, a tropical disease uh, prevalent in uh, many parts of Africa. Um, it, causes, it has a bunch of negative symptoms, rash, itchy skin, fevers, coughs, and chill. And uh, it's very treatable with medicine, but one of the issues is it's hard to get the medicine to places that need it the most without having some sort of point of care diagnostic system. So we actually, um, uh, it affects 250 people, uh, million people worldwide. 35% um, of the population in Ghana is, um, has been said to have uh, systemiasis at some point in time. Unfortunately, most of these people are school children, 40%. Um, so we actually were able to take this transmission-based microscope and look at urine samples and assess and validate the uh, efficacy of determining cystomyosin in a urine sample and found that it had 100% sensitivity for high infection rates. Um, lower, lower sensitivity for low intensity infection rates. Um, more specs about the device, but you can see it for yourself in one minute. And then the third, the third device that I haven't talked about yet is this ELISA well plate reader. This um, reads an ELISA well plate, which is a plastic um, device that is very commonly manufactured. It has 96 wells for doing testing, so it's very high throughput biological testing. Typically, these are color-based tests. So you place a sample in here with other reagents, and the color in the well will change based off of the concentration of the biomarker you're wishing to detect. ELISA well plate readers are benchtop machines that are maybe this big, and they're obviously very effective at what they do. Um, as they're everywhere in the world in, in well-funded clinics, um, they're designed to be modular for many different ELISA tests. Um, however, we've de designed a device that is for one specific ELISA test, so it uses one specific illumination and um, can be read with a mobile phone. 
So I can show that to you as well. Um, it has a really interesting design where it employs uh, 96 plastic optical fibers, which are very cheap and more robust than glass fibers. Um, and it actually couples the fibers directly to the well and condenses them onto the image sensor of the camera phone. So this is an example of an ELISA test. It's high throughput. You get 96 tests at a time. The left is an example of an image we can take where the brightness of the circle corresponds to the concentration of the biomarker in the ELISA well. And then the fourth device I have is the GRD analyzer, which I've already talked a lot about. And the fifth device is the fluorescent microscope for DNA imaging. Um, so that's it. So uh, if you want to come up and see the devices, I invite you to do it in you know, relatively small groups, four or five or six. And I, I will be willing to spend as much time with you as you'd like. Um, so ask any questions whatsoever. I'll try my best to open up the devices and give you uh, simple demos and things like this. So thank you very much. And uh, you can just kind of come up whenever. Uh, so I propose start to, from uh, group number one. Yes? Everybody, everybody. Group six is better. Six? Because after this. Uh, okay. So group number six can uh, come first because they should uh, come to M Lab uh, immediately after finishing this this seminar. So group number six, please. Yeah, so this is here. Let me turn it on. This is the transmission-based microscope. Um, here's an example of the blood cells. Now let me go to the live camera. So there's this focusing knob, which you can turn. It should be relatively well focused already. Um, loaded in here is a, a, a blood smear, just a drop of blood smeared across the slide. I have other samples here. There's a switch to turn on the keys. Um, so it's a bit overexposed now. The camera settings don't do an amazing job. We can turn the white balance up. Focus. Yes, so these are the settings that I'm messing with. Sorry. <laughs> you have to close the. So you can, if you'd like, just play around and you can insert any samples you want. There's frog tongues and other embryos and vertebrae in here. Um, now, one thing with this, the application doesn't allow you to zoom in beyond like this. But if you take a picture, you can zoom in further if you go to the photos and the phone is limited. Those are blood cells. No, this is live coming in right now. So the idea here is that. Yeah. And the idea here is that uh, the resolution maybe is not as good, but we can input this image. It's still a little bit out of focus, but we can input this image, send it to a server, and it can get back a sickle cell count, a malaria count, something like this. Yes. Yeah, so let's open this up. Yeah, all of these are made. All these are made with a 3D printer um, in our lab. Um,
hexagonal grating, and one is a square grating. They have very different. Uh, oh, should I, I have the mic here too. I'll, do, I'll turn that back. Yeah, so this takes into account the specific nanostructure as well as the fabrication variability, which is actually a pretty significant with this soft lithography type of thing. A variation by one nanometer of the plasmon resonance can make LED-based sensing very unreliable. Um, and so this type of framework mitigates that error by selecting the most optimal LEDs. For example, for this Um, so, for a specific plasmonic sensor, you need a specific LEDs. Um, these are interchangeable, though. This is just a cap. I can a cap. I can take it off, and it plugs in here. So I can I can just take this off and put on another cap. Um, but actually, the specific work. What makes plas plasmonic sensing so challenging is the fact that if you want to detect a specific protein. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, lysozyme, which is a protein in your tear fluid. You have to functionalize the surface of this gold sensor so that it captures only lysozyme. The biochemistry to do that is very complicated, and it's not incredibly robust at the moment. So there's a lot of research into making that chemistry robust. Or for instance, there's a paper published recently, they captured whole HIV viruses from a blood unprocessed blood sample and adhered those to the surface and used this exact type of sensor to measure the presence of those. No, without uh, functionalizing this sensor. You can, nothing, um, only bulk refractive index. So, yeah, refractive index, that's something, yeah, that's something. So without functionalization, you can't detect any specific protein. Um, but for instance, uh, you can put a microfluidic channel on it, like I've done here. And I can flow water or glucose solution or whatever. And, and this, this device would output a refractive index with 0 0.0005 refractive index unit accuracy. Five, five times 10 to the negative four. The, 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 the yeah. liquid, the cell can move on the grating on these uh, lines or not? The cell? The cell. If you change the position of the... Um, it's fixed. Everything's fixed. The, so each square here is a different design, but the ones that we use mainly, uh, this square and this square, the holes are about 380 nanometers um, wide and about 300 nanometers in depth, and the periodicity is 500 nanometers. They're, what shapes? They're cylinders, so they're circles that recess down into a, they're not, they don't go all the way through, so it has a bottom, and then it's a repeated structure in a whole array. Yeah, yeah, and they're very easy to fabricate. Um, you have to start with a silicon master that has the nano hole array in it already, but that only needs to be fabricated once, and then you can mold that into glue as many times as you want. And for this one, for the transition one? Yeah. Uh, white LEDs, right? White LEDs. For plasma geophysics, for detection, you use a label on it. For what? The for the malaria detection, oh, yeah. you use a label on it. A label, yeah. Mm -hmm. use a label. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, we're looking into using computational techniques as well to detect the malaria infected red blood cells. And there, there's a really interesting project too with gaming, actually, um, for detecting malaria, which I can talk to you about later. Um, yeah. yeah. Right, that's another big field, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm definitely interested in talking later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sequentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the cone in here, let's see if I can. And then this is really simple. It's a light cone. It's just a um, foil. <laughs> and it just tries to keep as much light in there as possible. And then the piece of paper, which should be glued, is a, just 
a diffuser. So it's actually a very specific piece of paper. It's not any piece of paper. And so it gets a really uniform illumination. So this ensures that each LED is illuminating the sensor at the same angle, which is very important for plasmon resonance because it's momentum dependent. You can couple into different resonances based on the angle of illumination. So in order to create a system that's calibrated, you every time need to be illuminating the, the sample at the same angle, which in this case is normal illumination. And normal illumination is also when the plasmon resonances are most, uh, are most sensitive for the localized surface plasmon. Is this audio that you also No, it doesn't need to be. The, the, there's an image sensor there. So this one is an example of, you could, you could build it around a phone, uh, but I, I didn't. Polarization? Oh, there's no polar polarizers, it's unpolarized. Yeah. It's just random. It doesn't need to be polarized. For surface plasmon resonance on a gold film, they sometimes do use certain polarizations uh, because only certain polarizations couple at a given angle. But for localized surface plasmon resonance, when you're coupling into structures, nanostructures, there's not so much a requirement. Okay, students uh, from group one to three, that was not in the preparatory school. Symmetric. And the y. Please come so it care what to view the experiment. Group one, two, three, that was not in the preparatory school, only for Winter College. Please come here. So here, this is the cartridge. So here's the excitation filters here. Uh, one, two, three. You was in the preparatory or not? No. Oh. So group here, here and be ready oh, to let me come. See. So let's see, let's see if uh, we're connected to the internet and I can show you the app. Yes, that is correct. Okay. And it's like okay. Okay. nano radius. So um, I don't have Giardia samples here because it'd be really bad to bring on the plane. Um, but I can show you the way the app works with a previously um, taken image. So, um, so I'm gonna find an image on the phone. Okay, group number six, we are waiting for you in the lobby for MLab, now. And you can continue to talk uh, tomorrow I'm going to give Professor will be available till uh, Thursday. So this isn't the actual image it's uh, processing. Um, I had to transfer that onto the phone, so I can't, I can't find it in the database. But right now it's uploading it to the server in LA, Los Angeles. And um, once it's uploaded, it does, the uploading does take sometimes a couple minutes because it's a raw image with 40 million pixels. So once the image is done uploading, it will then process the image and then return the result. So it, it's working. No, 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 this is an Eliza well played reading. That's the SPR reading. Yes. The person that this recording say me that if you look this camera and this camera, uh -huh. and we will try no student to be here, they to be or here. Okay. Or in this angle. Okay. This angle to be free and this because. Okay. These three. Yes. And okay. Take care about, about the microphone to be working. Okay. So this okay. one's on. Yes. Okay. We will change the group now. Yeah. This, you can. Uh, this side, how do you so this this is in here. Oh, okay. And so when you load in the Eliza well play, yes. you put it in here. And let's, so, let's grab this mobile phone. So uh, this one needs to be plugged in. This can be battery powered, but we don't operate it as battery powered because the uh, power of the LEDs are very important. So here, I'll plug it in. 
plug it in. Turn it on. So we actually use red illumination here. And now what you're seeing here are these ends of the fibers. Each fiber is coupled to one of the wells in the ELISA well plate. Um, and then again, we need to mess with the settings. But here. So this is the image we process. And if, if there was a bio target you were looking for, malaria, something like this, one of those would be very dim. And that would correspond to a very high absorbance because of the amino-linked absorbent assay going on. Colorimetry, yeah. And we actually do have a fluorescent-based uh, reader as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is the uh, can be adjustable? No. So there are, let's see, 20 LEDs or something like this here, red LEDs. So making those modular is very difficult. So this, this device is for a specific ELISA test, um, which if you were doing a lot, you know. Sure, this is a plasmonic reader I developed, and this has an image sensor at the bottom, and um, a cone here, and then this is a cone that guides the light down to an aperture, which then shines the light onto the image sensor. You then would take a plasmonic sensor, oh, the which is, would be dropped on yes, here. the sample would be dropped on here with a cover slip, and the service is functionalized to selectively capture an analyte, and you would put this in here and attach the USB to the, your, your computer, align it, and then, uh, and then turn this on, and these LEDs will sequentially turn on. It triggers the camera to take an image. And from these images, you can then get a, a concentration of the analyte. Or in this case, um, the experiments I did for the paper was just bulk refractive index. So I had a micro channel here, and I just slowly increased the refractive index over time and allowed this to sequentially take measurements um, to show that the plasmon resonance was indeed uh, changing. Um, so that's the DNA imager. So oh, okay. unless you have labeled DNA on you, it's okay. not going to do anything. <laughs> but you can turn it on. Uh, it's a laser diode. You can see here. Um, I think this one is the red mm -hmm. device. So here is where the sample would go. You can see the emission mm -hmm. filter there. Um, we have this hole opened up to do bright field imaging with just ambient light. So you can actually do it like this hold it up and take an image just to make sure your sample's aligned. And then you can put it on the table like this. It covers up the hole. And then you can do your DNA, the DNA yeah, imaging so or sizing. The labeling is uh, done by uh, fluorescent. Okay. Yeah, it's fluorescent. So the fluorescent like inside the sample itself labels inside the device. Um, no, no, no. The labeling, is, the labeling is done before, yeah. Before. Mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. What were they labeling to you? The, the dye is called Yo-Yo-1. Yo Yo One. Uh, it's a common. There's common dyes for DNA. I've never done a DNA labeling process, but it's very common in labs. So um, as long as you have the reagents, it's yeah. You can go ahead. Uh, I saw an image in your uh, presentation. Uh, the absorption uh, spectrum of gold nanoparticles. I see. I think gold nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's this. Uh, it will be connected to uh, a spectrometer, or itself can be? Yeah, yes. That is the conventional way to read uh, gold nanoparticle assays, plasmonic assays. Spectrometers, high-resolution spectrometers especially, are expensive. $1,000, maybe, for a high-resolution spectrometer. So this tries to make spectral measurements, but with limited spectral bandwidth from a collection of LEDs. So I have four LEDs with no, very different. It covers, uh, for example, visible array. No, it doesn't cover. It takes the most important sections of the visible range and creates actually a linear program to output the refractive index. Normally, what you would do is you would measure with a spectrometer the whole optical range. You would find the plasmonic resonance and track the peak, uh, which is the most effective way to do it. Um, but it's, it requires a spectrometer. Or and a broadband light source, both of which are very expensive. Um, but you can do it with just LEDs and a image sensor. 
but selecting the bands of the LEDs is a challenge um, because it changes given the nanostructure or the size of the nanoparticles. And it also, um, some LED choices that would be intuitive um, are not the best because of fabrication variability. Uh, so the, uh, each LED also individually, mm -hmm. yeah, not yeah, not at the same time. The same time. Yeah, they have to. Yeah. Oh, it has to be done individually. Oh. It's a scan. So here, they're, they're turning on individually. It triggers the camera automatically to take an image. And if it was hooked up to my computer, it would save the image. So you get an image stack. It's like a hyperspectral stack, a multispectral stack. Just intensity metry, not a spectrometry. Yeah. But you can imagine you have four images, because there's four LEDs. And you bin the image, you, you take an average pixel intensity, and you have essentially the um, overlap integral of the spectrum with the LED spectrum. And so this is spectral information. It's incomplete spectral information. But we showed in this paper recently that you can use this incomplete spectral information to still recover a very accurate bulk refractive index measurement. So the resolution of the spectral bands of our LEDs, yes? Yes, but it's, it's more complicated than that. Narrow band LEDs don't ne aren't necessarily going to get you a better result because of fabrication variability. What do you mean, which one? Um, so the work that was published recently in uh, ACS Nano on this device is all about the framework for selecting the optimal bandwidths with which to probe the plasmonic assay. Yeah, yeah. to trace the changes. Right, right, right. Because right. um, this is dependent on, like I said, fabrication variability. You know, you can imagine you have a, a solution of gold nanoparticles, right? 100 nanometers. They're not all exactly 100 nanometers, right? So you can't make a model of 100 nanometer gold particles and expect for your um, LEDs to work perfectly with that model because there's, there's inherent variations. And there's even more so variations with these nanostructures, which provide, uh, which provide a, a, a more sensitive assay than nanoparticles, but also provide additional challenges. Yes? Yes. Then you read, you have the liquid passing here, mm -hmm. You read, but what you read, so you have a shift in the plasmonic mm -hmm. How you read that? That's, that's the whole um, challenge of doing it low cost. It's very easy to deduce a spectral shift when you have complete spectral information. If you're using a broadband source and a spectrometer, you just track the peak. And your metric is change in nanometers per refractive index units if you're doing bulk refractive index measurements. Um, however, spectrometers and broadband light sources, especially those that are stabilized, are expensive. So we aim to try to build a low-cost system that just has LEDs, which gives us incomplete spectral information and an image sensor to just capture the intensity as it is transmitted through the plasmonic sensor. So we, we actually, all we do is we take images of this square under different illumination conditions, and we, we take the average pixel intensity, and we actually have a linear model that outputs the refractive index. But the difference is here, there are in terms of, uh, not of No, the, the, the difference here is wavelength. And the design is such that this is actually a cone that it acts as a light guide so that four LEDs can illuminate the sensor at approximately normal illumination. Just for illumination. Yeah, the, the, cone, the cone here. Uh, group cone. number one and two, you are invited to join this experiment, but please leave free space so here for recording close. by video camera. And that's really important because the plasmon resonance is, you couple to different resonances depending on your angle of illumination. So when, if you're creating a linear model, you want to be able, you want to be able to have a I invite you for MLAP. We want to take a sensor that hasn't been calibrated before and put it into the machine and output a result. We don't want to have to calibrate it, clean it, and then run it again. So we need to always be illuminating it at the same angle, and this is the easiest way uh, to achieve that. Oh, excuse me, 
spectrum of uh, mm -hmm. this, this sample. Like Please leave free space here. Yeah. Yeah. But is it was a transmission? Yes. Why is as I know, the absorption spectrum is in this. You're you're very right. I I I. I Photoshopped it. The, I showed one that was absorption from another paper, uh -huh. but for simplicity, because all this is transmission, I just I said it's transmission. Uh -huh. You're exactly right. But you can sometimes get spectral features that are peaks in transmission. I've seen yes. it before. Um, but these are dips uh, yes, in transmission. Yes, You're exactly yeah, right. You're exactly right. It's flipped. Yeah. I thought that maybe to uh, the whole of uh, absence gold is. Oh, no, no, no. No, it's normal. No, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. DNA set out which is That's this one. Unfortunately, there's no DNA here. But um, we have the laser diode that's here at a high angle to the um, first three group that was not in MLAP. So you are invited. That's in here. You can see the um, emission filters. There's that square. And this hole is so that you can do bright field imaging by, by holding it up to the light and aligning your sample. And then when you're ready to do a dark field measurement, you just put it on the table and it covers the hole. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is the system for DNA imaging and sizing. It's battery powered. It eats batteries pretty quickly though because it's a pretty high power laser diode. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a knob here for focusing the Z in the Z direction. And for what about pathogen? Mm -hmm. That's this, this system here. Yes. Excitation filters around here. The LEDs are in pairs of two. This is the cartridge where you would drop your water sample. Mm -hmm. um, the contents of the cartridge are disposable. Mm -hmm. So once you put your water sample here, you connect the cartridge to the device. And I think I uploaded an image a second ago to the server, so let's see if um, let, let's see if it gave us a result. Yeah, job ICTP. Mm -hmm. So then this is the uh, image analysis result from the server. So the green circles are the Giardia, and it gives you a Giardia cyst count here. Mm -hmm. And you know how much uh, volume of liquid you've dispersed, so you can make the calculation of cysts per milliliter to determine how contaminated the water supply is. So you uh, know you have an application for this, yes? Yeah. yeah, that's the application right there. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. so technically not, but that's how we do make measurements when we're doing functionalization for bi uh, biological samples. So we'll functionalize half of it to capture a biological sample and leave half of it unfunctionalized or blocked. Um, this is actually a continual measurement. In, in this fluidic, fluidic channel, I actually vary the refractive index over time. So the reference is actually the spectrum of this one sensor in water at the beginning. And I just and use that beginning just measurement and just subtract. Okay, so I normalize. The, the, normalize. The, but you're exactly right. This system, because it's using an image sensor that has an area of two or three millimeters squared, there's enough room to do a reference in one snapshot, which is unlike a spectrometer, where if you're coupled to a spectrometer with an optical fiber that's 400 microns, the only way to do a reference is to physically move the optical fiber underneath the sensor. And this, this can lead to problems if you don't get the movement just right or if you miss the reference if you're dealing with very small. So this has... Right. Right. So this does it. It's multi-pixel information. So you can have the reference and active area side by side in one image and you just take pixel averages of both regions. Yeah, there's a USB here um, that goes to the computer and the images are taken automatically. And these are, these are plasmonic sensors that are uh, fabricated on overhead transparency. Um, yes, so this is made with a molding process. So we have one, the overhead transparency. Plastic, it's nothing special. Um, 
and there's a gold layer on it, and that's what gives it its reflective properties. Which is the thickness of the The gold layer is 50 nanometers. 50. 50, 50. 50. 5-0. And uh, it's 50 nanometers it of gold. It's continuous film. Mm -hmm. uh, 50 nanometers of gold um, in the electron beam evaporator okay. is about it's is a, a electron beam oh. evaporation. So that is is an expensive bottleneck of producing these. That's but but form. each sensor is um, five millimeters by five millimeters, and in a conventional e beam evaporator, you can load about seven. Uh, four inch wafers. So you can pack a thousand of these easily into one electron beam evaporation run. Your equipment is um, most e beam evaporators I've worked with, three or four over the years, um, have a seven wafer dome. Some of them are four wafer dome, but even then, you, it's a very high throughput process. Um, what's not high throughput is when people in the clean room make one sample and put it in, and waste all the other space in the dome. But the lithography, soft lithography of molding can be done. I can make, I think I make sometimes 60 in a day before I go and do an e-beam run. And then I can go and deposit gold. And that's expensive. It does require a clean room, um, but it's high throughput, very high throughput. And the material cost of the gold is very minimal. Yeah, it depends on the, the system. Um, for the waterborne pathogen detection, um, because we're using a learning algorithm, it is processed on a server in a GPU um, with MATLAB. You can do it in C++ or CUDA to, to, to make it faster. Um, you can get uh, hundreds of times speed ups doing that, actually. Um, but most of these that have any significant image processing, yes, it's done remotely. Um, you could, in principle, do it on the phone. It would just take hours. And, um, for instance, I, I was able to send this image um, from here to LA, and it got back to us within about two minutes, and it gave us a cyst count in the um, cartridge. Doing it on the mobile phone here, there's no point because we're in a Wi-Fi space. And you can do it with a network, too, a cell network. Mm -hmm. solid way or liquid? The sample in this device? Yes. Yeah. So this, it's a liquid. It's a water sample, 10 milliliters. And you put it in here in this cartridge. The contents of this cartridge are, are just absorbent paper. Mm -hmm. So they're disposable. So once you're done with this test, you would throw these away. And you would have more absorbent pads for the next test. But yes, you, you put the absorbent pads in here, and you just, with a syringe, put the water on here. And the DNA? The DNA is done on just a glass slide, on a glass slide, and it slides into um, this device here. Um, the, the cover slip goes, it's just a conventional glass slide. And then you put a drop of DNA, and then take a cover slip and push it. That stretches the DNA, spreads it around. Crammed. Oh, yes, in here. Hold on. It's, I don't know why it's so low. And then, yeah, that's it. And then there's a switch here for the uh, LED or the laser diode. Laser diode sits about here, it has a hole here. So the sample would be here. I, don't, I didn't bring DNA. Um, it's here, and you see the excitation filter is that square that's reflective. And um, this allows this hole allows for bright field imaging with the ambient light. So you can hold it up and make sure your sample is aligned uh, with markers on the slide. And then when you want to image dark field, you can just put it on the table. Your DNA imaging. I, I was really worried about that. Uh, I have a letter from UCLA saying that they are not bombs. Um, but they didn't even search my bag. 
neither in, in Los Angeles nor in Paris did they search my bag. Okay. I just put it on the belt and I looked at it through the x-ray machine and it looked very suspicious, but they didn't say anything. They just let me go. It was plastic, so maybe. I guess plastic, yeah. yeah. The batteries and the laser diodes, though, I wonder. Uh, question about yeah. the design. You mm -hmm. need to print a special case for uh, every type of cell phone that you are working on. Yes, well, that's the way we're doing it now. Okay. Um, there can be clever designs. There are commercialized cell phone microscopes mm -hmm. that are compatible with different types of phones. Okay. They're not as large field of view and not as high quality images as this. But um, yeah, with the clever mechanical design, you could adapt it to other phones and, and have it be what modular. What about the, the coupling between the phone and these casings? Is there any problem of alignment? Maybe? So these Nokia Lumia phones are good because the camera's in the middle of the phone. Okay. iPhones, it's on the corner. Oh, that would lead to some awkward design, okay. possibly. But you can still design a system around it, it's no problem. Um, but another, another tricky thing, not so much with the fluorescent microscope, so with the on-chip imaging, um, you can't really do that on a cell phone because you need to decap the lens. You need to actually take the lens off, <laughs> which is something that people aren't going to just okay. do. No, right? no, they're not willing to. You have to have a cell phone just for that. Yeah. <laughs> for your cell phone. Yeah. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So in service plasmon resonance. Um, so in your equipment, you have a prism. And yeah, laser? yeah, you have a prism. Okay, Kretschmann, yeah. Kretschmann coefficient. Kretschmann coefficient. Uh -huh. okay. And you've got the light, and it yeah, refracts. Yeah, yeah. So, right. So this is your uh, uh, layer with the gold. Yeah. So um, this please is all the rest people join SPR, join experiment come resonance. but left one window on the front for the video camera. Localized service yeah, yeah, yes, yes. That's for nanostructures. Yes. So that is very easy. We just have a nanostructure, uh, uh, on this and we just the shine. The yeah, and we just shine light down at a normal, and we just capture it with a camera. It's here. a transmission. Transmission. Yeah. It can be done with reflection also. Yes, absolutely. Um, transmission seems to be more uh, sensitive, according to the literature. But this device is just transmission. You have LEDs. Okay. You have a sensor here. Okay. And it's just that. It's, that, a, it's just this simple. Yeah. So, uh, in the sense, you don't need this configuration now. You just nope. You do not need a, a Crutchman coefficient to couple into localized surface plasmon resonance. Okay. The uh, periodicity is 500 nanometers. So these are like 380 nanometers wide. The whole there's a nano hole array. And so the depth, depth is about 300 nanometers. Okay, okay. like this. And so it's like mm -hmm. like this. Yep, it's a dip. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. With the change in refractive index, it shifts. Red shifts. Okay. Yeah. And this device measures shift without needing to use a spectrometer or a broadband light source. Normally people watch the shift and they track the peak yeah. as it moves. Yeah. Um, this is the best way to read plasmon sensors, okay. but it requires a spectrometer and a broadband light source, which can be very expensive. Okay. So this just uses LEDs, uses incomplete spectral information, and it uses actually the pixel intensity of the transmission of each of these LEDs and it creates a linear model that outputs the refractive index. So it's, it's a bit different than tracking the peak, but it does the same thing. But it needs to be calibrated. Yes, it needs to be calibrated. But um, the paper that I wrote recently on this device, okay. uh, it's, it's not necessarily on this device, it's on the framework that calibrates it, that creates a universal calibration. The one ACS Nano? ACS Nano paper, yeah. So I've created a universal calibration for 500 nanometer hexagonal and square gratings. Okay. And you can do that using machine learning, such that I can give anybody one of these fabricated through soft lithography, and they can just use it. There's no need for them to calibrate an individual sensor, as long as it's the same structure and it's fabricated in the same manner. Welcome. Yeah, you, I mean, you can do a syringe if, it's, if you're just interested in a, a, having a biological sample in there. I had syringe pumps that were programmed for, for the purposes of the paper. Oh, someone. 
Wait, hold on. I want to take a picture of this. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. My, my professor will love this because it's not, it's not a Nokia Lumia. Yeah, so it works with any, any cell phone. So this, this uh, I, I brought this for demonstration because I can't exactly open this up, but this is contained inside here. So these here are coupled to the Eliza wells um, in here. So this sits on top of this, and this is in here. And then this is what you're seeing in the image. You're seeing the red light coming out of all these optical fibers. And we, we, build, we build the system for fluorescent uh, Eliza well assays as well. Um, this isn't the DNA imager. The DNA imager is there. Um, but I think that there might be some DNA Eliza assay kits. Again, this doesn't image uh, samples. It just records the absorption from all of the wells. So you don't get any uh, pictures of the things. You just get dots. Yeah. Yeah. It's a plasmonic reader. So the, these, uh, are you familiar with the plasmonic sensors? Actually, no. Okay, so these are gratings. Mm -hmm. It looks like this. Yes. The, the periodicity, the distance between the center of the holes is 500 nanometers. Mm. And these are uh, holes, like a, like a hole for a golf ball. And uh, there's a gold layer on top. And you shine light, even right now, there's electrons that are collectively oscillating here. And when you look at the transmission, there's a dip around some wavelength. In the case of one of these, that dip occurs around 580 nanometers. You can track this dip using a spectrometer, and it will tell you what the refractive index of the solution is. Or if you've uh, functionalized the surface to capture a specific protein or molecule, you can then detect the concentration of that protein based on this shift. And so this device does those measurements, but without the use of a spectrometer. It does it with just LEDs and an image sensor. Yeah, and there's the flexible ones, I think, are over there. So I have some I've made on a flexible substrate. Flexible. Yeah, so. So the idea, the dream here, mm -hmm, yeah. is that you can make these, you can uh, put them on a Band-Aid and put them on someone's arm, and it can measure an analyte and sweat, um, or something like this. Um, the physics is there for it to happen. The, the part that's currently being researched is how to functionalize the surface to capture specifically what you want to look for. That's the hard part. And there's a lot of research that has demonstrated this, but making it robust so that it's commercializable is what's very difficult. It's bio biochemistry. Uh, biochemistry problem. So usually antibodies, uh, antibodies. You're having to work with antibodies, um, uh, proteins, molecules. They have to form a very dense, densely packed monolayer. That process of self-assembly is very complicated and hard to um, get consistent from sample to sample. Storage is an issue. Yes. <laughs> to get a large signal, it should have a large density. This is the cap. Uh, for this. Cap for? This. I think it looks cooler like this, yeah. but. This, this is very interesting. Yes. Measures transmission, it's very simple. Um, again, the, the work here that's novel is, is selecting what LEDs. Ah, what's interesting about LEDs? So normally, plasmonic sensors are measured by using a spectrometer. 
and you get complete transmission information, uh, spectrally speaking. And there's a dip that corresponds to the plasma resonance, to absorption. Yeah. Uh, you then track th how this dip moves in spectral space towards the red um, in response to bulk refractive index or molecules being absorbed onto the surface. Um, that's the best way to read these. But a spectrometer is pretty expensive, and a broadband light source, especially if it's um, stabilized, is very expensive. So we tried to do that by using LEDs and an image sensor. Um, so in this system, we have incomplete spectral information. And this project, the paper that I recently published, is about how to select which subsections of the spectral of the spectral band as a whole are best for creating a calibration for these sensors. It's not obvious what LEDs you would pick um, because of fabrication variability and uh, differences in uh, different nanostructures. Have you tried others before? LEDs, well, I started with measuring with a spectrometer and you have so much more data than you need and you begin thinking about, well, how can I use this data? And you can use it to inform you how to design low-cost devices. It uses four LEDs. Four different, um, wavelengths. four different wavelengths. The battery is dying, so only a couple of them are illuminating now. But it uses uh, four LEDs um, at different wavelengths. And the wavelengths are selected through a machine learning algorithm that takes into account the specific nanostructure as well as the fabrication variability. Wavelength spectrum. All of these, um, so they're oriented at angles, but they're in a light cone that actually out outputs at a single um, single aperture. Here, okay. they all, so they're all illuminating the plasmonic sensor at approximately normal illumination, which is really important. Um, yeah, it's very low. You lose a lot of light, um, but you can turn the. Um, so again, this isn't a very high frame rate system. I mean. A frame is a, a spectral stack of the four LEDs transmitted. And you can see this is about how fast they switch. And they switch slowly because uh, the integration time on the sensor is really high because the power that eventually gets to the sensor is low. Also, these are not that transpa transparent. <laughs> you can hold it up to light and see through them. Um, but they're about maybe on average 20, 15 to 20% transmission. So you lose a lot of light even through this. Yes. So EBL is used to make an initial master one time, which has the desired nanostructure on it. Once we've made that nanostructure, we can make as many of these sensors, that, the one like you're holding now, by just molding that nanostructure into a UV curable polymer. This process is very fast, it's very easy, and it's incredibly low cost because the material cost is just the UV curable polymer and optical glue, it's not very expensive, and anybody can do it. I've trained lots of people to do this. You mold it into the polymer. And then you, you release the mask from the polymer, and it's clean, and the polymer is cured, and now a rigid nanostructure. And then you do have to take it to the clean room to deposit gold. But this is a very high throughput process. So we believe that these sensors are scalable enough to be disposable if they were implemented for some assay. Plasmonic sensors are not. Localized surface plasmon sensors are not commercially available yet, no. So it was just built? Built for this research project. There are lots of commercialized plasmonic assays, and there is obviously commercialized surface plasmon resonance with plain gold, gold films. It's been commercialized for decades now. But there aren't commercialized nanostructures because people typically in research labs don't use a molding process because it's not as, doesn't have as much control. So graduate students will go and spend a day to make one of these, and that's not scalable, so it hasn't been commercialized yet, no. And then there's lots of hurdles to overcome with the biochemistry to functionalize them 
to specifically target a bioanalyte. The substrate, the, the backing layer here is, is, is glass. And on top of the glass is a, a UV curable polymer, just a UV glue. And then there's a 50 nanometer gold layer on top of that. Um, no, we haven't yet. Um, I suppose we could. We're very interested in kind of open source type of work, so that would be a really easy way to do that. Um, the issue is a low cost 3D printer. I mean, people could just try, but the 3D printer that makes all these is a nice one. It's an expensive one. I think it costs like $60,000. We purchased it like five years ago, so that price has probably come down a lot. Um, but if you were to make one of these with a MakerBot type printer, um, which we do have in the lab, there's a lot of problems that come up. The plastic warps, um, there's not as high resolution, um, but maybe for the transmission-based microscope, it maybe it would be fine. And uh, hey, it's great if people are trying, even if it's not you know, with the absolute best materials. There, there are commercial phone microscopes. I mean, th th there's dozens. Um, they've come out in the past three or four years. They clip onto all sorts of phones, lots of different lens attachments. Um, they're not as high quality as the one we have here, not as large field of view, but you can buy them online for like 30 or 40 euros. And they're, they're fun to play around with. I should have brought, brought one. I have one I bought for Christmas. They're all the same depth. So actually here, these three are line gratings. They're line gratings. These two columns are hexagonal nano hole arrays with all of the same depth. The only thing that changes is the periodicity, but the aspect ratio is locked. It's the same. So the, the, the periodicity varies, yeah. So we go from 500 to 600, 700, 800, 900 and 1,000. And then over here are square gratings. So for the, for the work published in the paper, we stuck with the 500 nanometer periodicity gratings. And we validated the framework that we proposed in the paper for the hexagonal grating and the square grating. Mm -hmm. I probably read it then. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's a large challenge too. How do you know what is the best nanostructure? In my literature search, there's dozens of different types of nanostructures. Nano hole arrays, nano diamonds, nano triangles, all sorts of stuff. And it's, it's not obvious what's the best because people mo model it and get very good results and then fabricate it and don't. And experiments, it's a function of that and um, there's just so many factors. It's a, it's a function of fa fabrication. Soft lithography does not produce as high quality in terms of the sensitivity and figure of merit of plasmonic sensors as if you were to make these structures from scratch in the clean room using traditional um, EBM lithography. But it's a fine price to pay when you're making these in very high throughput manner. And for filters, yeah. Yes. Were you the one who asked this question in the talk? Okay, great. So yeah, I'm glad you came. This is a uh, this is a plasmonic reader mm -hmm. where I've just purchased an image sensor. 
You can build it on a phone, but I chose not to because it's a little bit of a hassle. Um, so yes, we, we also do just purchase the image sensors from Sony and build systems just around those. No, I mean, in, in case, let's say, I just want to use my smartphone, right? Uh -huh. And then it's having a lens. Do right. I need to remove that? Oh, 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 oh. sorry. <laughs> so you're asking about decapping the lenses yeah, from the cell phone. Yeah. These are designed to incorporate the um, lens that's already in the phone into the design. So we did not decap the lenses here. This works with any phone. Someone just put their Samsung phone on the color metric reader, and the image quality looked exactly the same as the Windows phone. So with that, uh, with that uh, lens also, you can just put another lens and then do... do yeah, oh, it's a compound lens system, yeah. yeah so we have external lens. lenses, and then we refer to the internal lenses. Lens, the phone. What will happen, you know, just if you have that one, the effective focal length will change. Yes. So your image plane is fixed. So yes. Then this, uh, the system software has to be really manipulating that to compensate that. And right, so that's why we have focusing knobs. So we do have a Z focusing knob here, mm -hmm. and on the transmission microscope, we have a Z focusing knob. Yeah, because it's, it's not good to have a completely fixed system. You need some degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I was just thinking something else. Yeah, Oh, oh, you're saying just working with the existing lens. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so the, the, mm -hmm. the problem with that is a lot of cameras, the iPhone 7 is different, but uh, they, don't, they can't focus very close. You can only get a focused image maybe about two or three centimeters away. Oftentimes we need to put the sample immediately over it. It, creates the, it makes a more compact device. Um, and... It also allows us, you know, a little more freedom in, in the, on top of it to put other optics. And then, is it possible, let's say, let's just say, you computer, that is a computer. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you? you? Can, uh, software, right, the software, and perhaps you can just... Like, like duplicating the screen and then sure. because this is a programming in your computer is much more easy than doing sure. something there. Or you just text yourself the image. So the Giardia one, we, we did, I did a demo just a couple of minutes ago. Mm -hmm. I sent the image through the Wi-Fi here to Los Angeles to our server. Mm -hmm. It processed the image, sent it back, the results. But yeah, you could do that with a local connection too. Yeah, yeah why not? No. 580 nanometer LED. I've got the batteries dying, so the higher power LEDs are not turning on. But we have, they're very specific. For gold and for our plasmonic sensor design. We chose these LEDs because they were outputted by a machine learning algorithm indicating that they would give the, the most reliable reading. That's the paper about this device is about that framework. So the wavelength is very important, and the bandwidth is very important. So we have a 580 nanometer, 525, 527, and 611. And what the, what the paper shows is basically, the intuition says to put the LEDs as close to the peak as possible, because this gets you the largest contrast, because the peak is shifting, right? So that's going to be the largest signal. Um, but it gives a very bad calibration, a universal calibration, because of fabrication variabilities. And you actually want to pick LEDs that are a bit removed from the peak. Um, these give a much better accuracy when you're using a universal calibration. What I mean by that is I can take a sensor that I fabricated independently and stick it in and just get a, get a result. I don't calibrate it for every sensor. That, uh, for the surplus plasma, I just see normally people use How do you make that one into normal incident? Right. So that's the really cool thing about local surf surface plasma okay. resonance. So it's really important to distinguish those two. Surface plasma resonance refers to a planar gold substrate on a dielectric layer or a planar you know, negative permittivity material. Um, but if you have a nanostructure, you can couple from many different illumination angles. The K vector um, requirement is not as strict. Mm -hmm. In fact, you cu can couple into different resonances. If I were to measure the transmission 
um, with a light source, a broadband light source, and if I were to change the angle of illumination, the spectrum would completely change. But you're still coupling into plasma on resonances. There's not one given angle because there's 3D topology of the, the LSPR sensors. Or like nanoparticles, right? Gold nanoparticles in solution also support plasma resonances, um, but they're completely symmetrical in three dimensions. So people use nanoparticle assays all the time, and they don't care at all about what angle of the illumination because why would it matter? So local surface, surface plasma resonance is emerging as a more practical um, technique for measuring molecular absorption. There's a lot of problems with it. SPR, surface plasma resonance by itself, has been very successful yeah. in the laboratory. Yeah. Um, Biocore has had its device on the market for 15, 20 years now. Yeah. And they can make incredibly sensitive measurements of that. More sensitive than localized surface plasma resonance. But localized surface plasma resonance is far more practical. You do not need you know, very precise optomechanical uh, equipment. Um, you don't need a Kretschmann configuration. But then, when you have this heavy, uh, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. Yeah. So when you have this nanoparticle deposited, it's just a picture. No, no, so it's a nanostructure. It's just a nanostructure. Mm -hmm. So it's a grating. So like mm -hmm. It's like this, yeah. and it's fixed. There's not nanoparticles. It's just No, <laughs> that's why that's why on here there's actually lots of different squares because we kind of just fabricated a bunch of different designs, periodicity pitches, and then experimentally found which one would be the best. We modeled them before, so we had an idea, um, but it's very difficult to optimize that for a given application because there's so many differences between the modeling step and when your final fabricated product, especially when you're using soft lithography and high throughput techniques. Normally, it will be taking some of the, let's say this is a old nanoparticles and then I excite that. So you're using a laser source, for instance? Yeah, so um, if you were on the plasmon resonance, 532 is, I think there are nanoparticles around that, then they would absorb heavily because they're supporting the plasmon resonances. And you would... Um, but that will if, be throughout the beam, right? Throughout not, the beam. Not, not, not a particular region. Throughout the whole beam. Yeah, there's no like threshold or anything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. So you, you would, with the detector, just measure yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the dip. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Or, yes, with nanostructures, the reflection is the transverse of the transmission. It's opposite. So when you measure a dip in transmission, you measure a peak in reflectance um, because they're re-radiating out the plasma resonance. Thank you. Why is this a Optical tweezer. Good luck. Yeah. No, I mean, so let's say if you have just uh, it's a DVD, DVD player, uh -huh. and that basically you know, focuses into that. Yeah. So you can use that one, couple of that, uh, these, and then correct. Yeah. From what I understand, though, optical tweezing uses radiation pressure. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what sort of enhancements you would get from surface plasma resonance. No, no, not surface plasma oh. resonance. I'm just trying to see that, let's say, you make a Oh, just, just in general? Education purpose. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, that's difficult. <laughs> it's really hard because you need, you need a really tight focusing, right? Yeah, but that uh, basically, you know, just I, I gave that one. It's a DVD writer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that laser diode is very powerful. Right. And then they focus it into that one micron. Right, so the technology is there. Technology. Oh, that's yeah. smart, right? Because it's fabricated yeah. a large... Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, if you, can, if you can find that technology, so that's I just, awesome. Uh, means I'm, well, I, I have made a uh, small... Uh, what the students do. Yeah. The way to do it is, is to go that route, yeah, to find that's technology that exists and that's yeah. cheap because it exists it's in mass. Exactly, yeah. and so that's uh, why I was just asking whether this uh, smartphone can just uh, this camera. Because uh, uh, there I have to. I have to uh, a lot of things that they are involved in. 
this camera but I've seen which is uh, can uh, um, well it depends on the size right yeah. From what I understand, the smaller the particle, the easier it is to track. Yeah, it's, it's something, so, let's say, one micron particle size. One micron? Uh, <laughs> that's pushing it. That's pushing it. Um, but there's no technological barrier to achieving one micron resolution. Um, we have under one micron resolution with the transmission microscope, mm -hmm. but it would be, you know, a pixel. So it would be very, very underwhelming demonstration. But if you use, you know, maybe you can play a little the other way and use bigger particles. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a sweet spot probably. Of the camera. Of the camera. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Bottleneck is the pixel because you end up there and then and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, normal uh, CCD cameras are bigger mm -hmm. and so. Yeah. Of pixel size. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so yeah, I don't. But then why people don't use this kind of uh, pixels? So CMOS is higher noise. Mm -hmm. Larger dark noise, dark current. Okay. CCDs are more, you know, well, yeah. cool CCDs. That you, that's what you find on an optical microscope. Mm -hmm. They're better um, in terms of getting a signal, but the pixel size is bigger. Big. Oh, okay. So okay. That's, 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 that's the reason. Um, but uh, again, I, I don't know the specifics. You could, in principle, use a CMOS. I don't yeah. know why you could, um, especially if you're using, you know, computational techniques to, you know, overcome some of the noise problems and find, you know, the, the Gaussian beam profile. Yeah. <laughs> no. Nope, just right for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. We have we have one whole lab dedicated to this. So this is the Giardia app. So um, so I'll, I'll now I haven't taken any images of Giardia samples with this phone. So I have to find find the image uh, in the camera roll that I've uploaded. Um, but but this one is an example of a GRD assist. Um, I'm just going to pick any. It doesn't matter what the preview image is. So I'm going to upload this. Um, so yeah, now now the app is sending the image to our server. The server will um, run the okay. assist count. Send so it back. Yeah, it's very frustrating because um, when writing your own applications, you actually, with Windows, with Android, with Apple, they are very restrictive in controlling the camera parameters. Mm -hmm. And Nokia only allows us to take, is the only one that allows us to take raw images. So we actually use the basic camera application to do the image acquisition. And the apps are for taking the image that's already stored on the phone and sending it and receiving a diagnostic a diagnosis, and diagnosis and adding whatever sort of information we want. It would be great if we could do everything in the app. Absolutely. You could have a lot of stuff. You could crop an image and send it, and it would go like that. Um, because here, the algorithm on the server is fixed. You know, if I wanted to change it, I would have to VPN and you know, remote desktop there and change some stuff. But if you had it on the phone, you, it would be much more modular. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the result. Yeah, it's the result. So here we actually, so the, the, the computer has gone through and actually circled the GRD mm -hmm. assists. And you see how it's, it's differentiated? It says mm -hmm. this one's not. Dust. Mm -hmm. 
or something. And then it gives you a syst count, a time, a date, all that stuff. Yeah, I'm glad you guys enjoyed. Yeah, all of, all of them has gone. <laughs> it's over, I think. <laughs> You're very welcome, yeah.